Hello, friends. Welcome to Experience Data Talk, a show featuring data science leaders and technologists from around the world. My name is Mike Delgado, and this is episode number 115. Today, we're chatting with Kira Wetzel, founder and executive director of Girls Plus Data, a fantastic nonprofit dedicated to helping girls get opportunities to learn about data and technology. And right now, since many kids have to stay at home, many schools are closed down, and obviously there can't be meetups or conferences, Kira and her team are looking at other ways to help kids keep learning about data and technology. In today's show, Kira shares how she is working with her teams at home during this pandemic. She shares advice to parents on ways to encourage kids to pursue careers in tech. She also talks about some of the biggest misconceptions that many of us parents and kids have about coding and working in tech careers. I also really enjoyed talking to Kira about her transition from working as a math teacher after getting her master's degree in education and then switching lanes entirely to pursue a tech career, which meant heading back to college and starting her career all over again. Her journey is super encouraging, especially for anyone who's feeling stuck in their careers and wants to pivot to doing something else. At the end of the show, Kira shares some really great tips around ways that we can continue to be productive and stay connected while we're all working remotely. Oh, and before we start, today's show may sound a little different, and that's because I'm podcasting from my young son's bedroom while working remotely. During the interview with Kira, you might hear some birds chirping in the background, a sink turning on to wash hands, and possibly even my son shooting Nerf guns in the hallway. Now, personally, I think hearing life happen in the background is encouraging. We're all needing to pivot. We're all learning what it, what it means to work at home. So I hope that all of you are staying safe and taking gentle care of yourself right now. If you've ever suffered from any sort of anxiety, stress, panic attacks, or depression like me, you know that this period can be emotionally difficult. That is why we need to prioritize self-care right now. We need to focus on recharging every single day and doing those things that we enjoy. So one of the things that I really enjoy is working on this podcast because I get to video chat and learn from amazing people like Kira Wetzel. I had so much fun talking with her and learning from her, and I'm super excited to share out this discussion. Here's our show. Kira, thank you so much for being on Data Talk. Yeah, thanks for having me. So right now, this is actually a special edition of Data Talk because I'm home. A lot of us are working remotely during this uh, coronavirus Mm -hmm. pandemic. And we're all kind of figuring out how to adjust. And right now I'm actually in my son's room. He graciously let me, <laughs> letting me use this as my office. And um, I wanted to first just ask you, how are you doing right now with everything going on? Sure. So, um, okay, personally, I, you know, I'm very fortunate. I have a lot of things in my life that have made this, I think, really uh, minimally disruptive. So, you know, um, recognizing though that that's really a privilege that I have you know, from a Girls Plus Data perspective, I'll share that we have been canceling events and we've canceled all of our events through the end of May. Um, You know, we're evaluating rescheduling on a case-by-case basis based on the community that we were scheduled to host in. And in response to canceling our events, we're actually working on spinning up our virtual learning a lot quicker. Um, You know, I'm a former teacher, and so understanding that there are a lot of um, teachers out there, parents that don't have structured learning, you know, tools, um, and then the the kids in our community don't have structured learning opportunities right now. I think it's the perfect time with us as volunteers, you know, not having the in-person events and the kids needing, um, you know, just things to learn and absorb throughout the school year. Have you had any talks with any teachers about how they're doing um, working with different students? I haven't had a lot of um, you know detailed conversations. I think what I'm seeing is a lot of teachers banding together, and you know I do have a couple of friends that are teachers, and we've been in group chats with them, and we're seeing them say that they don't necessarily have the tools or the infrastructure. Um, you know, I actually, I guess to that point, I think what coronavirus is going to do is it's going to force different systems and communities around the world to advance at a quicker pace towards um, more remote and virtual programs um, and then services. And I think that, you know, based on my experience, a lot of companies resist virtual working models and 
And educational systems, just quite frankly, aren't equipped to provide those learning opportunities from an infrastructure perspective. Um, and there's some valid reasons for, for not moving as quickly towards those, you know, setups. But I think that we're going to be seeing a lot of innovation from teachers that may otherwise not be, um, you know, hosting online learning communities could be just a time perspective that they don't have the time in addition to their in-person classes. Um, but I think we're seeing a lot of teachers try to learn tools like YouTube Live, Facebook Live, um, hosting, you know, very informal tutoring sessions. You know, the extreme downside, I think, of coronavirus is that we're going to see a lot of social stratification coming out of this. Um, it's going to be glaringly obvious who has the tools and the resources to, to be able to um, innovate this quickly. And there's, of course, a large population of students outside of teachers in the schools that are serving those students that just aren't going to have the, the technology resources to participate. What do you think might be some solutions? Do you see any hope um, as these new technologies are being made available? Because you're right, there is a whole bunch of students who maybe don't have the technology, they don't have the Wi-Fi access. There is there is a whole bunch of limitations there. And I'm just kind of curious, like, as you're looking at all of this, are there any, any rays of hope? Do you see any sort of solutions that might be able to help these kids improve their, their learning? That's a good question. I think in the future, after um, our communities are able to stabilize from coronavirus, we might see more technology donations popping up from um, companies and organizations that can afford to do that. Um, right now, I, I don't have an answer. I would love to be part of that solution. I think this has you know, swept our community so quickly that people didn't even have a chance to start trying to problem solve. Um, you know, in an ideal world, we'd have libraries and we'd encourage kids to use libraries you know, schools would have rental programs or things like that. Um, you know, you'd be able to have group learning, but with the social distancing in place and a lot of states adopting shelter in place initiatives and orders, you know, I just, in the short term, I think it's going to be hard to see a solution to that problem. Obviously with your company, Girls Plus Data, you are passionate about helping girls um, pursue careers in STEM. And, and obviously you're passionate about just caring for them. And I'm wondering, if you could right now talk to some of these girls who are right now at home, they can't go to school, they want to keep learning, they want to keep growing, but now they don't have a teacher in the classroom and maybe both their parents work. I don't know their situation, but I was wondering if maybe you can just share um, some things that they can maybe do right now while they're home to not only keep learning, but also stay connected with, with the data community. Sure. I think um, one of the things that we try to really drive home is that data is everywhere. Uh, we ask how, you know, Target or another retailer might be using data, how a company like Starbucks might be using data or a hospital system. And conversely, we ask how might an insurance company be using data? Um, and they're using the same data that a, a healthcare system is using, right? But for completely different purposes. So we try to emphasize that data is literally everywhere in our lives. It, it's, you can't escape it. And so the advice I would give, even if we don't have the technology and the hardware or software to actually be doing things with data is to just keep asking questions. Um, I think that's, you know, that's one of the key traits I think makes somebody very successful in data analytics. Um, and just in general is to really be curious and just always be asking questions. What about some of the emotional needs? I mean, I think, you know, a lot of us are, now that we're working remotely, for those of us that are used to being in an office and being around a lot of people, um, that can be like a lot of fun uh, for those who like the interaction, like, like to be social. And now being home, and certainly kids that are no longer with their friends, now they're home, um, they can feel very lonely, very isolated. And I was wondering if you have any advice for those kids listening in. Um, they're looking for some social interaction. Um, and it's really tough right now because we're being told, you know, you need to stay six feet away plus from people. Um, 
during, you know, from physical distancing to help reduce the spread of coronavirus. I was wondering maybe you can speak to um, those kids who may be feeling a bit lonely right now. Yeah, I'm trying to think because as um, as a very well hidden introvert, I really like and value my alone time. But I can definitely see where in three weeks I myself am going to get cagey and I'm an adult. Um, you know, I think there's ways to stay connected. I've seen. I know this is going to probably oversimplify the problem, right? But I've seen people who are meeting up across the street to talk to each other. You know, I know that works in a more suburban area and not so much rural areas, but, you know, still sitting on your driveway versus someone else's driveway and just talking or, you know, um, I don't have a really good solution. You know, in this digital world we live in, I might say audio books of some sort or podcasts or things like that. Um, I wish there was more opportunity to join webinars, which is what we're trying to do is spin something up where we can have small, um, you know, interactive sessions with kids just about things that are outside of, you know, your traditional um, K through 12 topics. But I don't, you know, I think it's just doing everything we can to just have little sound bites throughout our life with people that are real interactions. You know, actually what's interesting is one thing I've noticed is that Today's youth tend to have their noses in their phones or their devices anyways. And so um, I wonder if like this had happened when I was a kid where we didn't have a, uh, the mobile you know, technology that we have now. And my computer was literally an Apple IIe sitting on a desk. And I couldn't take it with me and stick my nose in <laughs> it somewhere if I would have um, had a harder time than kids now who are are used to spending more time with technology and having a lot of screen time, um, which is still kind of available, you know, depending on who you are and, you know, where you live. I love that you're thinking about hosting more virtual events and webinars. I think that's a great way to help expand learning for those that maybe can't go to a local event. I'm curious about what are some of the, the topics that you're finding as you've hosted different events in different places that girls are really interested in learning about? The biggest misconception about data, I would say, or STEM is that you have to be a software engineer. You have to be really good at math. You have to be really good at science. Um, one of the things I think that really sets our organization apart is that we do not, you know, pitch girls plus data as an organization that you're going to need to code in. We are spinning up workshops and have done workshops where kids are learning about SQL and they're learning how to load databases, which I think is really interesting um, when, when you see how quickly they pick that up. But we're not pushing the idea of coding down their throats, and that's been very well received by, by the kids. And so the biggest questions we, we see when we gather data from these students is, um, where else is data being collected? I think, you know, there's a lot of people out there that don't really understand what data is, and data is just information. It's collected from different systems, whether it's people or software or, you know, hardware. Um, it's it's just information, and so helping kids understand that their information, whether it's, you know, a video or audio or something they put in, you know manually using their their thumbs right into a device um, helping them understand that all this data exists somewhere is trackable and that it you know it could even potentially come come back to them later uh, is I think what kids are really wanting to learn you know in response to that we are we had on our roadmap for 2020 to spin up um, some different virtual events at wouldn't necessarily be teaching the hands-on technical instruction, but would be engaging and be teaching them the supplemental topics that are just as equally important. So an example of that is um, privacy and ethics and data. So that's one that we can host virtually, make it engaging. We don't need the software or the hardware necessarily that we would need if we were going to be teaching them how to build or engineer something. Um, and we did pilot this at our predictive analytics workshop in Washington, D.C. about a month ago, and it was very well received. Um, you know, the kids don't understand what I call incomprehensible scale of their data. They just 
they know, oh, I put my email here. Oh, I put my phone number here. I put a text message here. But don't understand that once it goes beyond, um, you know, once they log into TikTok using some login credentials, that, that that's actually passed and all the information from the original source is passed as well. And so um, one of that's one of the um, first workshops we're going to be trying to develop. In addition, we're going to be launching a series of um, virtual career panels that are just going to have different professionals. Um, you know, our first session is going to be on, on healthcare and anything related to health or biomed, given what's happening in our communities and how they use data. So not necessarily an engineer, but it could be a nurse. It could be a consultant, could be people working on the payer side, um, could be researchers, but just people who are using data in, in health right now. And so I think that those two topics are going to address the question that kids have, it, that is, where is data? Um, where else am I seeing data? You know, where may I not be thinking about it just because I don't know, but it's there and it's very real. As you've been hosting these different workshops and classes, what have been some of the reactions from the kids who have come in maybe having no background in, in data or coding and they're coming in for the very first time and I'm just kind of curious, like, what has been some of the feedback you've received? It's been super positive, actually. So we are, um, so we've taught almost 500 kids now, which wow. I think is really impressive. And that's not including, you know, the three workshops we just had to reschedule and then the virtual workshops that we have coming up. A good majority of the feedback is they had no idea that this existed, that there is literally an entire domain dedicated to data and that there's different fields within data. Um we really pitch our workshop as the intersection of art, math, and technology. We have different topics, but you know, our first one is really, um, it's, it's going for, did you know that data is a thing? It's very structured, it's very guided. We're teaching them how to build data visualizations and start that question awesome. asking process in their mind. And almost all, um, all the feedback is I didn't know that this was a thing and they really like it because it allows them to be creative um, and they feel like more confident in their creative abilities, even though they're really good at math and, and logic. And so um, I think that's probably the number one piece of feedback that we've got. That is fantastic. Have there been kids um, who have been hesitant because they feel like, oh, that's that STEM stuff. I'm not really good at math or I'm not good at that type of technology that's probably not for me yes i remember a young woman very specifically actually I'm gonna, so this was um in raleigh north carolina one of our sponsors there cisco um this is our first year with them we had a bunch of kids they opened it up internally and some parents registered their kids uh one young woman she came and she was she had that look that you know, kind of preteen girl look, at, you know, like I hate yeah. to say it, but I was totally that angsty you know, teenager, preteen too. She was, I, you know, I was like, oh, hi, introduce myself, talk to her. She's like, I really don't want to be here. It's, like, it's going to suck. I'm so, you know, she's already got in her head that it's going to be boring. Um, by the end of this, we had taken them on a, a tour of the Cisco data lab and she wow. was actually in the back and I have a picture of her and she's kind of like dancing, which is really funny. And I leaned over, I was like, this really sucked, right? And she's like, I had a good time. But the <laughs> best part about it is we saw her at the next event. And, and of course she looked way older, but I was like, I recognize you. And she was sitting with about five other kids oh. that had come that first event as well. So that was a really big success. That is super cool. So that is awesome that you got a tour of the Cisco Data Lab Tell us about like how all that works because that's that is so cool to give kids exposure to like a real data lab at a huge company. It was really neat, very generous. Um, you know, I want to just quick thank Sean Bishop over there. Um, you know, as a director who is our executive director and executive sponsor, and then Chris Myers, who's the senior manager, who gave us these tours, who is just amazing with kids. You know, we got a tour of they had some endpoints that the kids were able to look at. And I think the interesting thing about that is those kids don't look at that as being data, right? They just see the video and they just hear the audio, but they don't understand that large amounts of information and data are being transported back and forth. And um, that's that's how they get this 
um, ma like magical system in their eyes. And so they were really fascinated with that. They're fascinated by um, the Cisco drawing board that they were able to par participate in. And then when they walked through um, the like the server room, they were able to see all of these server racks and were like, this is where information is stored. Like it's stored in the cloud, but it's also stored, you know, physically here. And this is like real physical information. So trying to explain to them that sometimes you can't have data that can be stored in the cloud for different regulatory reasons, or people just don't feel comfortable with it. Um, there's a there's a myriad of different reasons why you would actually have this physical storage like your phone or computer, but um, that this is large, large scale versions of that. That is super cool. What a what a great, great experience. Are are these events like are you hoping to do more of these types of like hands on like come to a lab, check this out events? Yes, we like to provide that opportunity. Um, if our hosts allow that, they have that. So, you know, we also had an opportunity to view the Purdue, um, you know, the Purdue Data Lab 2, and they showed some, I think it was uh, AR setup, um, wow. different ways that they're using technology there. And the kids were very interested in that. You know, not every one of our uh, hosts has a data lab for us to look at, but if they do, we do like to ask, is there any way we could see that? Or the kids could have a tour, kind of mixes things up a little bit, but we are scaling right now, um, you know, as an organization, we just onboarded three new chapters. So there should be events coming in Atlanta, Memphis, and Madison in 2020, um, assuming our communities are able to stabilize again. I love that you mentioned um, how much creativity, curiosity, and art is part of this, because sometimes I feel like those three areas are kind of separate from the data community, even though that is like essential. Like to be a good data scientist, you have to be highly curious. You have to be creative. And having that art background for data visualizations is a huge plus. Can you talk a little bit about the art aspect of these programs and how you're kind of exposing kids to data visualizations and thinking visually about data? Yes, absolutely. So to that point, we do an activity. So our intro to data visualization workshop is broken up into a series of activities. The first um, module is lecture style with a couple of interactive um, modules. Then the second part is the hands-on where we're actually teaching them to build data visualizations. But everything in the beginning kind of leads into what we're about to do and why it's important. And one of the module or one of the modules we do in the lecture style is we show them a table of data. Um, it's sales numbers, just made up sales numbers. Um, I think it's about 30 or 40 rows of data. And we ask them what's the highest and the lowest value. And you can see them all scrambling and they're racing up and down trying to find those values in the list. And then you say, okay, and you take, you know, you take the responses and then, you know, in, uh, you know, using our best PowerPoint transition, we then show them a line chart. And then we say, okay, now show us the highest and the lowest value. And they're like, oh, it's right there. And, you know, of course they're like, why didn't you just show us that <laughs> at the beginning? You know, and I'm just like, well, this is, you know, a prime example of why we need people to be creative, right? It's very easy for us to show you this table of numbers that we've just put down, but um, you need to be able to think outside the box to show this data in a way that makes it easy for people to understand, which we just did. And then we show them an example of a map. And we say, we show them a list of the cities that we've been in. I think there's like 16 or 17 different cities we've hosted events in. And we say, okay, what are the regions that we have hosted events in? And of course, they're like, they're, they're easily able to identify theirs. And they're like, oh, that's south. And then they kind of get, you know, you can see them, the wheels just start cranking. Mm. But we show them a map. And they're like, oh, okay, so this is like the north and this is the west coast. And so, um, you know, those I think are two really hallmark activities of those kids learning why it's important to be creative in data visualization and data science. I love that. Those are, yeah, those are two really good examples. I'm curious about your, uh, your thought process on curriculum and how you're kind of developing these programs to be helpful and also super interesting to these young girls. So 
I used to be a teacher, um, you know, in a past life. I got a master's in education. I was teaching high school math. I really liked it. I was, I really enjoyed teaching, but as a closet introvert, I, it was hard on me, you know, and those kids, when you see people have those light bulb moments, it's really, really, um, you feel good inside, you know? And so it's a little bit, um, I don't, I don't want to say selfish, but it's driven, you know, by, by the way I feel personally, but I didn't want to lose that. I just didn't think I could do that, um, you know, for the next 40 years of my life. And so I went back to school and I got a degree in information systems. Um, I did not know that this field exists, uh, even though my dad was a computer programmer. Oh, wow. I had no idea that data, data science was a thing. And so I started taking classes and well into my first year, I realized this is amazing. And I wish I would have known this ahead of time. I definitely would have done data science and analytics, um, you know, right out of the gate. And so I realized if I didn't know about this and I came from what I consider like a tech family, right? Like I had my first computer at a very young age. I was always exposed to that, that there were probably several, um, many, probably millions of of kids that will never know that this exists until maybe later down the road. And so I said, I really love teaching. Um, I really love working with kids. I have that experience and I have that background. I I understand how to put together lessons. I understand this domain. And I just, um, to be honest, I kind of threw together my first lesson plan, which is now the intro to data visualization that we teach. And it was so well received that, Mm. you know, we just kept iterating on it. And it was taking data and, and translating it into something that kids could understand And it might have been a lot easier for me to do because I myself was not an experienced data professional at the time. So I was also learning. And a lot of times we break those concepts down for kids just like we do for adults. Um, And so I think that's how, you know, I, I think that's how we got our first lesson. And then we just keep iterating and we listen to the kids and we ask them, what do you want to learn? Um, A lot of trial and error. And I have this awesome curriculum team that's led by Becca Knock, who's got really good experience teaching with Girl Scouts and, um, you know, other organizations similar to ours. So I think all those things have have really pointed us in a direction of success. Can you talk about things that you've learned, like what not to do when teaching these subjects? Because I'm just thinking about myself as a parent, and I have two young kids, and I want to encourage them to be creative, to be curious if they're interested in working as in coding, like I want to encourage them in that, or if it's more the data visualization side, but I want to give them a positive experience. And I'm just curious in your lesson planning and in your, um, in your teaching, are there things you can give as far as like best practices to parents or other teachers that want to create a positive learning experience for kids? The number one thing I'd say is kids love options, just like people love options. Um, But we have to present those. Um, It can be really challenging. And I know this from, you know, not only being a teacher, but also having girls post data now. A lot of parents don't know that data exists and they think of data as a tech field, something that's really technical or really specialized. And I think that's paralyzing to people, right? That aren't really technical themselves. And so um, I think, you know, providing options, being able to, you know, I want to say like relate these really technical concepts to everyday life, but that, you know, upon reflection feels unfair because if you're not technical, you wouldn't know how to do that. Um, But I think there are ways to, to learn those things. And it could be just listening to podcasts or watching Ted talks. You know, there's some really great podcasts about how technology impacts our day-to-day lives. And there's one I can think of off the top of my head. It's called Note to Self. It's on NPR. Um, So I would say just having exposure to those things, you know, kids are like sponges and they'll pick it up, providing options. And, you know, I guess the other thing is that we just hear from a lot of kids that they feel like coding is jammed down their throat a lot. And so that's probably something, you know, that catches their, they say, you know, they're interested in what we're doing because they're not interested in coding. So Maybe not pushing STEM, STEM, STEM and coding, coding, coding is being one and the same. 
that's that's really good because I think you're totally right. Like, if you don't, if you're not into coding, that's not interesting to you, or it's just seems too complex, and that's just not your thing. That can make you feel like, well, I guess STEM's not for me. I'm just going to stay away from all those classes because you had a poor experience with Python. Right. If you, you know, it's hard to teach. We're not trying to turn kids into data scientists. What we're trying to do is say, hey, did you know this is a thing? Hey, this is an option. Um, what we don't want to, you know, people to do is get to their 10th, you know, 10th grade, get to college and, and they realize I had no idea that this was even an option, you know, and, and it's too late. They're already on their path to become, you know, a different career. They feel like they can't go back. You know, one of the reasons why we target middle school is because by high school, kids are pretty set at what they're going to be doing for the next four years. Mm. Um, and so if we can provide this as an option and something to think about before they, they get to those four years of, you know, whatever their interests are, um, then I think that's important. You know, I, I love that you're, you're working with middle school students because you're preparing this next generation, like 10 years from now, they're going to be in college or going into the workforce. And there are going to be jobs that don't even exist yet 10 years from now. And you're right now kind of working with this generation, helping them get curious, exposing them to really cool career fields and other areas and topics that like, look, this is an area if you're interested in like, go that way. Like that's Here's a path for you. And actually, here are some different people who are doing these types of roles. How are you working with these kids when there are so many different careers that don't even exist yet, right? Like 10 years from now, there's going to be a whole bunch of things that we're not even sure, like what types of roles are, are going to be there. You know, that's a good question. I, I never thought about that um, so concretely. I mean, we do tell kids that the amount, like the volume and velocity of data that's being produced is so great that, you know, there's going to need to be people that understand data and how to make sense of data to, to make sense of it, you know, in five, 10, 15 years, even, even in three years. I mean, oh my God, that's such a good question. I mean, we don't, I guess one of the things that I think we try to do is we try to stay platform agnostic. Um, we have sponsors that are different software providers that you know are super generous to us and we do try to teach with different tools and that in itself may be a way to boost that um you know we're teaching concepts and thinking and an analysis and the ability to dig in and ask questions and those are going to be skills that are important whether or not you're using you know platform a now but you're going to be using platform d in five years and you know, maybe Python 2 gets, you know, sunset, now we're on the Python 3 or et cetera. I mean, um, I think the fact that we're just doing a bunch of, we're teaching the same concepts using different tools, um, I think is probably conducive to that. It's not, it's not exactly teaching them, you know, that there's going to be jobs we can't think about, but it is helping them towards the I should understand the concepts of how to do this and not the software, the technical capability. I think that's right. I think that's definitely the the strategy to go. Like you're teaching the foundational principles, the important things like asking smart questions, how to think creatively, and and then also kind of the skill sets needed to be able to create a data visualization or being aware of different types of programming language that you may need to use or have someone else work with. Like all that exposure is going to be so useful. Um, and I love that you're kind of just opening these doors uh, to show people like, hey, you know what? If you if you like coding, here's a path for you. Here's some languages you can learn. If that's not your thing, here are some other technologies. Here's other things you can be doing. And I think just like as you're opening these doors, you're just expanding minds and showing possibilities. You're really hitting a really important area because you're right, so many of the uh, camps that I see out there are like coding camps and they're very much fixed on learning a programming language. And that is great, it's a great foundational thing, but it's not for everybody. I, I thought it was also interesting that you shared about your transition, getting a master's degree in education, teaching, and then switching lanes entirely to work in technology. And I was wondering, if, what, I mean, I, I think it's very, very encouraging on so many different levels. Can you talk a little bit about your mindset when you decided 
that I'm not sure that teaching is right for me. And and then because like changing from education, having a master's degree in education, I mean that's a serious commitment. And then to go go into a technology field. Can you talk a little bit about your mindset that led you to that point? Definitely. So I think my mindset was after a few years of teaching, I I think I just started coming, you know, I started coming home and I was feeling so tired and I, you know, would go back to work and realize that like I was never going to be my best self and and therefore was never going to be bringing um, my A game. Not that I was slacking, but, it, you know, when you're that tired all the time and you don't have the ability to recover, you just realize, um, you know, I'm not not my best self right now. And so... I decided, you know, I think I hit 30 and I was like, if I'm going to do this, I should just do it. I went to, um, you know, my my local campus for University of Wisconsin. I talked with an advisor. I said, these are my interests. These are the things I like. And they helped me pick out some classes. And I started picking out things that I just didn't know about. Um, that was, I just like jumped right into taking some programming classes. I was like, okay, so I, I know I thought about doing technology as an undergrad. And then I realized like, you know, I didn't know what I was talking about when I was an undergrad. You know, I just was like all over the place, um, which is why I think it's really interesting that they ask you to commit to a major, you know, <laughs> it's a terrible idea. Um, and so I thought, I don't want to do technology because, you know, it's a hobby and I'm not going to like it. Um, if I have to do it full time, but I just dove in and I kind of, I was very fearless. That's one thing I've, I think for me, I've never been afraid to take risks and try new things. Um, if you had asked people, they'd like list off all these random hobbies. I just really like learning. So when I did that, I realized like, actually, I really enjoyed, really, really enjoyed the technology and the programming. It was a different kind of problem solving um, that I had to do. So I stayed the course and I started taking classes and, you know, data architecture and data science, um, analysis and things like that. And I realized I was still solving these real world problems and that I wasn't just sitting in a cube or something or a closet coding. Like I was actually solving these business problems. And that may have been due to the fact that I have an information systems degree, which is in the school of business, but, um, that was just really interesting and I enjoyed that. And so I just continued on and here I am. Uh, I, I really love my career now. That is super cool. And it had to be hard, like, because you had given so much of yourself to go into teaching, uh, getting your master's degree, getting the teacher credential, being in the classroom, and then realizing like, I'm not sure this is the right path for me. Like that takes a lot of guts to like go back to college and try doing something else. Yeah, it was, you know, I think for me, it was like, okay, people are going to judge me. They're going to be like, oh, she doesn't know what she wants to do. And I'm like, well, they're not wrong. So I might as well, <laughs> you know, might as well just do it. Um, but I just feel, to be honest, I feel very lucky that I was even able to do that and that I was fearless enough to make that jump and then yielded the results that I did because I have quite a few friends that I can tell you are really, really unhappy teaching. And after I made that jump, they reached out to me and they were like, I really want to, you know, transition out of teaching, but I'm afraid. I don't know how. And um, some of them are still teachers and they won't make that jump because they're afraid. And I'm not, you know, I don't, I think I have a little bit more freedom in my life, um, but people that have, you know, dependence and responsibilities like that probably don't have the liberty to just make those jumps like I did. So I, I do think, um, you know, in some ways I was fortunate that, you know, I was, a, I, I was a little bit younger and was able to be a little bit more bold in that career choice. What advice do you have for those listening in who are encouraged by your career move and maybe feel similar that they're in a role that feel that they feel like, I don't think I'm made for what I'm currently doing. I feel like I'm called to do something else. Um, but they maybe need a little advice, a little encouragement. Can you talk to that person who is maybe feeling a little stuck and like, 
you know what? Kira did it. She made a path for herself. Can you talk to that person? Definitely. So I think um, it can be really hard to do this. So I don't want to oversimplify it, but it's stepping back and looking at what are your skills and what do you like doing? Um, I think a lot of people that are in a career, they think this is what I've been doing for 5, 10, 15 years, and this is what I can do. This is my expertise. And sure, there may be some very, very specific hard skills and qualifications there. But, and I, I hate to, again, oversimplify it, but I think pulling those transferable skills out are, are really important. So a friend of ours, um, she and her significant other just moved out here and she's a practicing mental health counselor. Um, you know, she went, she actually got her master's degree in mental health counseling like my husband. And she, I think was looking to try some new things. And, and like me, um, she was like, I don't know what I want to do, but I just know I don't want to, I don't think I want to keep doing this. And we chatted about some things. I was like, I could see you being really good at this, maybe health policy or, um, you know, you know, some, especially social media networks, right? Like they have people evaluating content and helping them put together mm -hmm. uh, programs and policies for content moderation, especially with online bullying and mental health issues, things like that. I was like, you could do that. Like you have the knowledge and expertise to be helping to shape those policies and programs. Um, she ended up going to a startup that's doing telehealth, uh, mental health as a program manager. And, and she went right from being a mental health counselor into doing that. Wow. So, those are the transferable skills, right? She's got that expertise that they needed, um, even though she may not know tech or startup life. She's got this other really great body of knowledge that's super valuable. Um, and so, you know, thinking outside of that uh, immediate scope, I think was was her ticket to trying something new. And so that's what I would say also is, you know, think don't think about it on such a micro level, but if you can step back. That's fantastic advice. And I love the fact that um, because you're a teacher at heart, you immediately started to just, like you're looking to always give back, like you're just a giver. Can you talk about your move from teaching to then you now got your degree in a technology field and now you're now working and you're like, you know what, I wanna teach again. Can you talk about that move? Yeah, I think, that is one of the joys of my job is I, I think being, um, you know, being in the roles I've been in, there's always this element of teaching full time, but it's or not full time. Um, all of this element of teaching in my full time job, but not a full time teaching role, you know, helping people really understand what data is um, throughout the day. Surprisingly, a lot of organizations, even uh, Fortune 500s are not super data driven. And they don't understand how data impacts them. And so that in itself is really enjoyable to me, you know, being able to help my um, cross-functional partners on a day-to-day -day basis think, oh, wow, I, I, that's a good point. I didn't know I could use data to do that. Or, you know, we should be using that kind of data in this way. Um, you know, outside of that, that's one of the reasons why I really love Girls with Data because it allows me to still do that teaching, but not to the point where it's full-time and I feel drained. Um, anybody that's done a Girls with Data event knows that at the end of you know the day, you go home and you are just ready to snooze. And, um, <laughs> you know that's a sh short lived, and you still feel really, really exhilarated from you know working with these kids all day and having them have those moments. So, what advice do you have for for parents who are raising kids and um, are looking to just encourage them? in STEM careers or just kind of opening those doors. And maybe there isn't a Girls Plus Data event near them, mm -hmm. but they, you know, a lot of kids like a virtual uh, classroom may not work for them, but being at a event where they can see other kids and actually have hands-on training or like like the, some of the events you're leading at data labs, like those are really cool types of things where you're actually in person. And right now, obviously with coronavirus, like we can't do those, but when we resume, um, what are some things you, you can say to encourage parents to help kids kind of uh, find those opportunities? Searching out other organizations that are doing it, even if they're not doing it in your immediate community, is going to be um, one of the bigger ticket, you know, ways of getting 
getting that exposure. As we're working on our additional um, curriculum paths, you know, what we're doing is we're trying to then share resources and we plan on having a bank of resources and some how to's on how to get going. I know it's not a substitute for that in-person learning, but I've noticed a lot of organization, even those that are trying to teach really technical skills are trying to make um, resources available at home. You know, staying plugged into your community where people like myself or, you know, other, um, I, I could list a bunch of people that have just reached out to us about mm -hmm. wanting to help uh, because they're retired data scientists and they're contributing to Girl Scouts, you know, in their community or, um, you know, they used to be a physician or things like this. I mean, these people will pop up for us. They hear about us. Um, and so I think we've been lucky in that we've had the visibility of the organization, but I see these people being very plugged in in their org. And so the more connected that a parent can be, the more likely it is they're um, going to stumble upon these resources. The other thing, and again, it's like very, um, it's not the same as having the, hand on, the hands on instruction, but listening to technology podcasts or, um, you know, I, I really think that there's a lot of podcasts out there, really short ones that can be great for in the car, you know, 15, 20 minutes. That that one that was note to self, I think that was like a 20 minute podcast. It was like perfect for car mm. rides, you know. Um, listening to those things will help also just provide the exposure and the knowledge and awareness, even if you don't have the resources like a, a data camp or um, other workshops. Um, can you speak to the different professionals that are listening in who might want to get involved? You mentioned some of these career panels that you have going on, mm -hmm. and also some of the organizations you're working with, like Oracle, who have opened up data labs to you. Um, for people that are listening in that are like, you know what, I want to find a way to give back. I want to help inspire this next generation. I want to do my part. Not quite sure how I can do that. So. We have, there's a variety of roles that we have. Um, we, you know, we're planning to post the, the thing with girls to say that, so we're a hundred percent volunteer driven. Nobody takes a salary here. It's all something we do because we're super passionate. It's a very diverse group. Um, there's a lot of people that started out in a different career and, and, you know, transitioned into data analytics somehow. And so, um, we are, you know, we don't look for a specific technical background. We do look for people who are really passionate about our cause and who have um, an understanding of the STEM landscape, maybe the, the girls or women in tech movements that are happening and then hopefully data as well. Um, but one of the reasons I think we succeed is because even though we're 100% volunteer driven, we have roles where people work remotely and that's what their schedule can allow. Um, everyone on my team is awesome. They're super committed and they're very clear about their commitment to set expectations. Um, and some people can only volunteer on the day of at an event within their community, and that's okay too. Some people are interested in getting involved. They can check out our website. Um, definitely follow us on social media. Um, you know, in addition to this, honestly, just really amazing curriculum team that we have, we have um, this, I mean, I, I'm impressed with them all the time. I'm always showing my husband, I'm like, wow, look at his social media. I mean, they're doing a killer nice. job. Nice, that's awesome. Um, yeah, and so following those, because they're the ones that are publishing about, you know, different volunteer opportunities, whether it's just at an event or it's ongoing or it's a virtual career panel that we're about to host. Um, they're putting that stuff out there for people. And so following us is probably going to be one of the best ways to know. Check out girlsplusdata.org to find out about upcoming events, resources, and people that are involved and also how to get connected and get involved with Girls Plus Data. Um, Kira, one last question. As sure. many of us right now are uh, working from home, working remotely, and are kind of doing that transition, do you have any advice for how to stay high performing, how to manage that work-life balance while working from home? You know, understanding I don't have children running around, which I think is uh, this giant complexity that I couldn't even myself begin to navigate. I do have dogs and uh, my husband's also working from home now. So he, you know, we're competing a little bit for some space, but I would say, to be honest, forgiveness of, of yourself, a little bit of grace towards yourself is probably going to be your, your ticket. You know, I know myself from 
having kind of this perfectionist personality that when I expect too much of myself, I start to crumble a little bit. And so really just knowing that everybody else in the world right now is going through literally the exact same thing. I mean, this is a, a global health crisis. And so um, none of us are perfect and we, none of us know what we're doing. So I just say grace and forgiveness and, you know, pick up tomorrow is a new day. You know, you have one day where you're slacking and maybe you didn't change out of your day PJs into your night PJs and vice versa. You know, just start over tomorrow and put your day PJs on. You're, you're right. I mean, having grace and self-care is really, really important right now. And I think, again, nobody knows, right? This happens so quickly and systems and communities can't, they're stabilizing. So why would, you know, we expect ourselves to be very stable in, in this um, global, you know, health crisis that's not stable, so. And how are you um, staying connected with your colleagues? Sure, so um, during the day, I work at a social media company here in the Bay Area, and we stay connected by having regular meetings. Um, so typically we meet on Mondays in person, but because none of us are in person, we've added uh, Wednesday and Friday meetings. Um, we usually are, we're a very tight team and, you know, usually eat every meal together. So we're doing like virtual lunches or virtual breakfast. And then we're hosting virtual, you know, office hours for our business cross-functional partners who still need help, lunch and learns, things like that. And then at Girls Plus Data, we're all pretty connected already. Um, we use Slack and we host meetings with each other and just ping each other with funny stuff, so. Well, uh, Kira, I wanna thank you for taking time out of your busy day uh, to talk with us about the work you've, you've done uh, with founding Girls Plus Data and all the work you're doing to empower this next generation. Um, thank you so much for Dana, being on Data Talk. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Data Talk. We share out new episodes every single week, and you can find the full catalog of previous episodes as well as YouTube videos by going to the Experian News Blog. The URL is just experian.com slash data talk. And as always, we love hearing from our community. So if you have any comments or suggestions for future shows, please reach out. You can find us on Twitter at Experian Data Lab, or you can always reach out to me directly. My email is michael.delgado at experian.com. Take care and we'll chat next week.